In some prior editions of this book, chapter 10 and chapter 11 were one chapter. So it's really like we were just turning the page and keeping on talking about what we had been talking about. We had developed or begun to develop the aggregate expenditures model. Aggregate expenditures meaning add all the spending together. So remember the C is consumption spending. The IG is businesses spending on capital. The G was government spending and XN was net exports, exports minus imports. Add all that spending together and you have aggregate expenditures. In the last chapter, we just looked at consumption. We introduced investment, but we didn't talk about it a lot and we didn't do any government or net exports. So we're gonna add all that together in this chapter. So I told you several chapters ago, in the beginning anyway, that we had started out the semester by looking at Adam Smith as the economic philosopher that our nation was built on, a laissez-faire economy where the government ideally would not play a large role in the economy. But as we move to this part of the semester, we're moving away from Adam Smith's laissez-faire philosophy into John Maynard Keynes' philosophy. So this topic in the last chapter, in this chapter, and through the rest of the semester is very Keynesian, Keynesian, based on John Maynard Keynes' philosophy. And his philosophy was that the government had an absolute um, mandate to interfere, to be a part of the economy, that if the economy was sliding into a recession, it was the government's responsibility to do something. Or if inflation was beginning to be a problem, that it was the government's responsibility to do something. So we're laying the groundwork here for chapter 13 and 14 and 15 and 16 in order to see what could the government do? How could the government affect a change in the economy? When we use the aggregate expenditures model, it's a fixed price model. I like the term better fixed than stuck, but I get why they're saying stuck. The stuck price, is, it's like we're we, where we are at the moment, but we're not letting prices change as we develop this model. So when we get to chapter 12, We'll take the same learning, but we'll let prices change. So in this model, prices are stuck wherever they are at the moment. We're still assuming that GDP equals disposable income. And we talked at the beginning of the last lecture that that's a bit of an abstraction from the real world. We know it doesn't exactly equal, but it approximates it and it helps our learning. So we're going to leave that, um, that assumption in place. We start out with private closed economy because we haven't yet introduced government and we haven't yet introduced net exports. So right now we just have consumption spending and investment spending. That's right where we left off at the end of chapter 10. So we had looked at an investment demand curve based on that investment schedule. So here they've given us a schedule of GDP and investment. So they're saying if investment is 20, per, uh, 20 billion, I'm sorry, if investment is 20 billion at all levels of GDP, let's look at that. So here's our investment demand curve. There's the 20 billion level. I don't know if you can remember from the last chapter, but the chart in the last chapter showed us that at interest rates of 8%, there would be $20 billion worth of investment projects that yielded an 8% rate of return. So if we're gonna add that onto this uh, aggregate expenditures model, it's going, to, the investment's going to come in as a straight line because investment is not dependent on GDP. Investment was dependent on interest rates and rates of return. But remember, on our vertical axis in the aggregate expenditures model, we had consumption. Now we're going to add investment, but investment doesn't change as GDP changes. So it's just this horizontal line. 
So when we add it, and when we add investment to the consumption schedule, we're going to keep the slope of the consumption function, that slope was the MPC, remember, and we're just going to shift it up by the $20 billion of investment. Okay, here's another long chart, and I know it looks very overwhelming, but it's very logical, so and you've already learned some of it, so we don't want to get it too heavy. We can do this. So column one is just levels of, employ of employment. So I'm going to skip that for a second and go to column two and see that's that GDP equals disposable income. That was our column one in last uh, chapter's chart. So the way you would read this is that if we're going to produce $370 billion worth of GDP, we'd need 40 million people employed to do that. If we're going to produce at the 390 level of GDP, we'd need 45 million people to do that. Okay, so we're just adding the number of employees needed to produce that level of GDP. The third column is consumption, which is household spending. Fourth column, savings, household savings. Fifth column, investment, how much businesses are going to spend. We didn't see that in the last chapter. This is a new column, investment, but we know that it is 20% because the interest rate they gave us to work with was 8%. So we'd go back to that investment schedule or the investment demand curve, whichever we had, and say, well, if interest rates are 8%, investment is 20 billion. Because investment didn't pin, did not depend on GDP, it does not change anywhere down along these rows. It's 20 billion all the way down because investment's dependent on the interest rates and the rates of return, not on GDP. Then the sixth column, now it's time to get aggregate expenditures. We're going to add something together. Aggregate expenditures just means add the spending. Right now, the only spending we have is consumption and gross investment. In a minute, we're gonna get government and net exports, but on this chart, we just have consumption and investment. So we're just gonna add those two columns together. Well, consumption is column three, that's household spending. Investments, column five, that's businesses spending on capital equipment. So we're just gonna add them together. 375 plus 20 is 395. 390 plus 20 is 410. 405 plus 20 is 425. So you see, we're just adding columns three and five, consumption and investment to get aggregate spending. Column seven, that's a new column two, and it's an interesting column. I want you to think about it unplanned changes in inventory. So GDP is how much we're producing. Aggregate expenditures is how much people are buying of what we produced. So to get unplanned changes in inventories, you're going to take the GDP and subtract what people are buying. So when we produce $370 billion worth of GDP, People bought 395. They bought more than we produced. How can that happen? Well, this is not the first year we've produced, so we had some existing inventory. At the beginning of January 1st, there's already inventory on Walmart shelves, right? If you think of a giant Walmart that houses literally everything we produce in the nation, that's, you know, seems like it's true sometimes. So there's already some inventory on the shelves. In the, in the ensuing year, then we produced $370 billion more GDP, but they came in and they bought 395. That means some of the inventory that was on the shelves is depleted. We don't have as much inventory on the shelf at the end of the year as we had at the beginning of the year on row one. We're $25 billion less, okay? So let's go down to column 10. Let's look at the, I mean, uh, row 10, I'm sorry. Let's go down to row 10 and look at the flip side. On row 10, we produce 550, 550 billion dollars worth of GDP, bottom of column two, and they came in and they bought 530 billion dollars worth of GDP, bottom of column six. So we produced 550, but they only bought 530. So now there's $20 billion more inventory on the shelves than we had at the beginning of the year. So I wanna go ahead and look at column eight. 
So tendency of employment, output, and income. All three of these will move together. If, if output's going up, then employment's going up, so income is going up. If output, meaning GDP, is going down, then employment's going down, and income is going down. They'll all move in the same direction. So let's go back to our unplanned changes in inventory column. If it's a negative number, in other words, if GDP that we produced is less than what people bought, then we're going to get a negative unplanned changes in inventory. Inventories went down. If inventories go down, don't you expect that businesses will respond to that and increase the amount they produce in the next period? Well, yes. So they're going to produce more output, more GDP. To do that, they're going to have to employ more people. And when we employ more people, the income will go up. So when we have negative unplanned changes in inventory, we expect employment and output and income all to increase. On the flip side, on rows 7 through 10, GDP is a bigger number than aggregate expenditures. So when we did GDP minus aggregate expenditures to get unplanned changes in inventory, we got a positive number. That positive number means there's additional inventory on the shelf that businesses didn't plan to be on their shelves. So if they've got more inventory than they plan, does it stand to reason that they're going to decrease the amount they produce? Well, yes. So now GDP output will be going down. Well, if we're not going to produce as much, we don't need to hire as many people. As a matter of fact, we need to lay some people off. So producing less means we're going to decrease our employment. And when we lay people off, the national income is going to go down. Those people are not going to make as much money. Okay. So let's look and find equilibrium. I want you to remember this forever and always. I want you to remember that when we're getting equilibrium, what is going to be true, what we're always looking for in an equilibrium condition, equilibrium, let me see if I can get a cue out of that. Equilibrium equals or is when, let's do that. Sorry, I don't like that equal sign. That's really not true. Equilibrium is when GDP equals aggregate expenditures. That's your definition of equilibrium. Please hang on to that. You'll, you'll read or hear some other things, but this one will hold you all the time. Equilibrium is when GDP equals aggregate expenditures, okay? So here's our equilibrium highlighted and bolded and all that. When GDP equals aggregate expenditures, that's our equilibrium, okay? So when we are at equilibrium, it is a true condition that unplanned changes in inventory will be zero because we're producing and selling the exact same amount. So inventories will not have changed. So now we're starting to add on to our aggregate expenditures model. So all of the spending is on the vertical axis. Notice right now we have consumption and gross investment. Right now that's the only two kinds of spending we have. We're gonna add government and net exports, but right now we have a private closed economy. Private meaning there's no government, closed meaning there's no net exports. So C and IG spending are gonna be added together on the vertical axis and GDP real domestic product on the horizontal. Last chapter, when we just had consumption, we had disposable income on the horizontal axis. But now that we have two categories of spending, consumption and gross investment, we're moving, instead of calling it disposable income, we're gonna call it all of GDP. Remember, we had to put in a 45 degree reference line that just bisects that 90 degree angle into two equal pieces so that we can see that when a data point falls on the 45 degree line, what's on the vertical axis equals what's on the horizontal axis. So first just look at the, I guess the more gray of the two lines and that one's just consumption. 
That came from the chart back in the last chapter that showed us what consumption was, although I think it was repeated again in our last slide. Then we add investment to it. Remember, investment is not dependent on GDP. So investment does not affect the slope of the consumption function. The slope of the consumption function was the marginal propensity to consume, the MPC that we calculated in the last chapter. So now we're going to add investment to it, and so it's just gonna shift that consumption curve upward by the amount that they tell us investment is. And they told us investment was 20 billion. So we shift the consumption curve up by 20 billion to get our consumption plus investment curve. Right now, that's the only two kinds of spending, so that's our aggregate expenditures model. The equilibrium GDP, when we only had consumption, was down here where it crossed the 45 degree. Then we added investment, and so now the equilibrium GDP is where that higher consumption plus investment curve crosses the 45. So then equilibrium, goes out here to the axis and it'll be that 470 and goes down to the bottom axis and we'll notice it's going to come in at the same 470 again. <clears throat> so at the 470 level of GDP, the amount we're spending to purchase it is the exact same amount as is being produced. So the unplanned changes in inventory will be zero. So there's some other features of equilibrium GDP, but I do want you to remember that equilibrium GDP, we always are going to use the formula So equilibrium GDP is where GDP, but you realize, wish I could write better with that mouse, where GDP equals aggregate expenditures. That's the very definition of equilibrium GDP, where GDP equals aggregate expenditures, where what's being produced equals how much is being spent to purchase what was produced. There are some, um, other conditions, for example, savings equals planned investment. If you look back a couple of charts, you'll see the savings column and the investment column and at equilibrium, that line that was highlighted at 470, savings and investment would be the same amount. That's not what I want you to concentrate on for equilibrium because it's too easy to miss when you're working the problems. Concentrate on the condition that equilibrium GDP is where GDP equals aggregate expenditures, and then that's gonna be true. That means there's no unplanned changes in inventories. Mercy, that was a lot of uh, lines that came on the chart at one time. I wish I had them coming in one at a time. So you saw the 45 degree line first, that's fine, good. Um, <clears throat> then it's just showing us some changes in GDP. So let's look at this. So we have the light gray line in the middle, C plus IG zero. So that first equilibrium point is right here where it crosses the, the uh, 45 degree line. So we started at an equilibrium GDP of 470. Let's say we increase investments. So that they're talking about increasing investment would be shifting this line upward. And when we increased investment, we shift that line upward, that caused the new equilibrium point to be up here, okay? So how much did GDP change when we shifted this line up? Well, the original GDP, this, this original number, I'm gonna label it with a zero here, was 470. The new one, when we shifted up investment, invested more, brought us to 490. So I want you to think about this. We calculated last chapter what multiplier they were using. So let's just use what they used last chapter, 
if our MPC equals point, um, let's see, they use 75, 0.75. If our MPC is 0.75, what does that make our MPS? <clears throat> if you spend 75 cents of a dollar, how much do you have left? So that would make our MPS 0.25. Okay, because those two added together give us our whole dollar. And then if you'll remember the multiplier formula, the multiplier formula was one divided by MPS. So then what's our multiplier? That makes our multiplier four, right? And then what was that change in GDP formula? Well, let's do our change in GDP equaled the multiplier I'm going to abbreviate that because I'm tired of trying to do that. Multiplier times change in spending. Okay? So this would have been the change in investment spending that we just looked at. Remember that triangle means change. It's a Greek letter delta and it always represents change in a math or science class. All right, so we know some stuff. We know the change in GDP went from 470 to 490, so that was 20. I should have put change right here. Change in GDP was uh, 20. We know our multiplier is four. So what was that change in investment spending? Okay, we could restate this formula to be change in investment spending equals change in GDP divided by multiplier, or we can do it like we did in third grade and draw a box and see what's missing. Four times what is 20? So that would be four times five. So this change in investment spending would have have to have been five billion to have, when we shifted it up, to have caused this $20 billion change in GDP if our MPC is 0.75. That's the same thing if it decreased. So if we move from um, C plus IG zero from that original line to C plus IG two, now here's our new equilibrium. Notice that instead of 470, it went down to 450. So that time the change in GDP was a negative 20. So then this must have been a negative five, <clears throat> meaning the decrease of investment caused the decrease of GDP. Okay, so we're still moving on. That's a good thing. We had our aggregate expenditures model in the last graph, just had consumption and gross investment, and now we're ready to add international trade spending to that um, aggregate expenditures line. So how do we calculate net exports? Remember, it's exports minus imports. We want to count everything that's produced here in the United States, we don't want to count the imports. So when we do that calculation, exports minus imports, the, the number, the net exports, could be a positive number or a negative number. If we import more than we export, which we do in the real world, the net exports will be a negative number. But in your problems, they could be positive or negative. This graphic just shows that. It says, here's all the levels of GDP. Assume net exports is a positive number in column two. Assume net exports is a negative number in column three. All that you really need to get the idea of here is that it's not dependent on GDP. Net exports just is what it is. Exports minus imports, it doesn't matter what the level of GDP is. So the next um, graph that we looked at, will the next graph we will look at shows us what net exports would look like on the graph when we add it as positive and what it would look like on the graph if we add it as negative. Okay, so here's our graphic. So the um, light gray line in the middle 
shows us where our original C plus IG line was that we just looked at. So here's our equilibrium. It was at 470, remember? And now we're going to add that positive 5 net exports. So just like when we increased investment, if net exports is a positive number, it's going to shift this curve up. If it's positive, if net exports is a negative number, it's going to shift the original line down. So more spending shifts the line up, less spending shifts the line down. It changes GDP just like the investment change that we looked at in the last slide. You'd have to know what the MPC is to get the MPS, to get the multiplier, and then put it in that change of GDP formula. So just a fun graphic that shows you some net export information um, on a global basis. And then we think about what can affect net exports. What could cause our exports to go up or our exports to go down? So the first thing we think about is prosperity in the nations that we send our exports to. For example, Canada buys a lot of our exports. So if Canada is in a prosperous time, they'll buy even more and that would increase our exports. But if Canada goes into a recession, then they're gonna buy less of their own stuff and less of our stuff, and that would decrease our exports. Another fun thing to think about, or I think it's fun, is the exchange rate. So as we send our goods and services out all over the world, then we're trading our US dollars for their currency and vice versa as we import and export. So the exchange rates matter. So think for a minute about if the dollar gets stronger, so the value of the dollar goes up against any world currency that, that we have to look at them one by one by one, just to say the dollar goes up against the peso is the Mexican peso is not to say the dollar goes up against the Canadian dollar or um, the Chinese yuan or whatever, it, it's currency by currency. So let's say the dollar goes up against the Canadian dollar. What would that mean? Well, that would mean we could buy more of their stuff, but they couldn't buy as much of our stuff because their currency didn't buy as much as it did before. So changes in the exchange rates can affect our imports and our exports too. Tariffs are taxes on imported goods. If tariffs go up, it makes the imports more expensive, and so we might not buy as much of that import. Remember that this is a political topic, and so when we increase tariffs, let's say against the cars coming in from Japan, then they're going to increase tariffs against the goods that we send into Japan, perhaps the rice. So we have now consumption and we have net in, um, gross investment and we have net exports into the aggregate expenditures model. We're just missing one more sector, the public sector, government. So now we're going to add government into the model. So this chart gives us a chart of absolutely everything now, which is fun. Because, let's see, column one, here's our GDP column, which can also be thought of as disposable income, but let's call it GDP because we've got the whole model built. Then we have consumption, that's household spending. Then look over to column four, we have gross investment, that's businesses spending on capital equipment. Then look at these two columns of five, we have Exports and imports, remember net exports is exports minus imports. Well, in this particular chart they gave us, they made exports and imports the same amount. So our net exports is zero. I wish they hadn't have done that, but so be it. And then government spending. So now they're telling us that government spending is gonna be 20 billion. Well, government spending just is what they tell us it's going to be. It's not dependent on GDP or interest rates or rates of return or, Anything else that we've looked at, it's just whatever they tell us government purchases are going to be. It's a matter of Congress and the President arguing back and forth until they get a number for the budget. 
So government purchases are 20. So now let's look at that last column, aggregate expenditures, C plus IG plus XN plus G. We usually say G plus XN, but it doesn't make any difference. They're all added. So look across the columns you're going to add to get aggregate expenditures. You're going to add consumption, column two. You're going to add investment, column four. You're going to add net exports, exports minus imports, but in this case that's zero. And then you're going to add government purchases. So if we look at column one, that would be adding 375 to 20 plus zero plus 20 is 415. So look at this chart and see where you find equilibrium GDP. What was that definition of equilibrium GDP? Right? It was where GDP equals aggregate expenditures. So where do you see that happen in this chart? That's well, all the way down at the bottom, isn't it? So all the way down at the bottom, we have GDP is 550 and aggregate expenditures is 550. So the equilibrium level of GDP on this chart is 550. So let's build our graph to show that. There's our 45 degree reference line, just C, then C plus IG plus XN, and now C plus IG plus XN plus G. Now we have the total model built. We know equilibrium is where the aggregate expenditures curve intersects the 45 degree line. So our aggregate expenditures then intersects 45 degree right here. So here's our equilibrium GDP. So we can come to the bottom and see that's 550. This new chart adds taxes in. So we've got GDP in column one, taxes in column two. I want you to notice that column two taxes and column eight government purchases is the same number because for the purposes of learning this information in a principal's class, we're going to assume a, a balanced government budget. When there's a balanced government budget, taxes and government purchases will be the same amount. There's no deficit, there's no surplus. So we have disposable income. Remember, disposable income is income after all the taxes have been subtracted. So GDP in that first column equals national income, then take the taxes out, there's disposable income. Then we have consumption and savings and investment, still net exports and government purchases. We're still going to get aggregate expenditures the same way that we did before. We're going to add the spending together. So look at your uh, consumption plus investment plus net exports plus government purchases and you'll see your aggregate expenditures column. Now, remember, equilibrium GDP is where GDP equals aggregate expenditures. So if you go down this column and you're looking to see where GDP equals AE, that's now at 490. So GDP is 490 on, on row 7 and aggregate expenditures is 490. This is just the graphic that shows the adding of the taxes. So government spending was 20 and taxes were 20. Well, when we added taxes into the model of 20, remember we had an MPC of 0.75. So MPC of 0.75 times 20 means that consumption decreased by 15 billion, 75% of that total change. So consumption decreased, that shifted the aggregate expenditures curve downward so where we had seen an equilibrium GDP of 550, consumption decreasing by 15 times the multiplier of four is 60. So that gave us that $60 billion decrease in GDP. So we use all of this information to analyze recessionary and inflationary gaps. In other words, if spending is less, then the equilibrium GDP that we would need to get to full employment level, then we need spending to increase. 
if spending is more than we need for the full employment equilibrium level of GDP, then we would need to decrease spending and the government can assist in ways to doing that. That's the Keynesian way for the government to assist the economy in times of recessionary or inflationary gaps. Remember that recessionary means we don't have enough spending. The spending's below the full employment level. So the government could increase government spending, decrease taxes, or a combination of both. An inflationary gap means we have too much spending. And so the government would want to decrease spending. So they could decrease government spending, or if they increase taxes, that would decrease consumption spending. So here's our graphics to show that. So the one on the left, notice it's labeled recessionary gap. The one on the right is labeled inflationary. So on the left, AE0 intersects the 45 at the 510 level, and notice they're pointing to that as being full employment. But if spending decreases, slides down, now we're at AE1 and spending will only, the amount of spending we have at AE1 will only generate GDP of 490. And that does, that's not enough to get everybody fully employed. So we'd have to do something to increase spending to push AE1 up to AE0. So we know our multiplier is four because all through this chapter, we've been dealing with an MPC of 0.75. Subtract that from one gives us an MPS of 0.25. Multiplier is one divided by point, yeah, one divided by the MPS, one divided by 0.25, so our multiplier is four. So we've got that change in GDP of 20 billion, 510 down to 490. We're trying to get it from 490 back up to 510. That's an increase of 20 billion that we need. We know our multiplier is four. So to calculate that change in spending, we can uh, just invert that formula we've been using. Let me go ahead and write it up here. So change in spending that we need. So slow. Change in spending equals the change in GDP that we need. Remember we needed a $20 billion change in GDP divided by our multiplier. We had a multiplier of four we needed, a, in this a recessionary graph we're looking at, we need a spending change of 20. So we're trying to get spending to increase. We're down at the 490. We want to get up to 510. So we need $20 billion more GDP. We have a multiplier of four. So that means we need spending to increase by five. And that's what they're telling us here. We need spending to increase by this five billion. So we look at the next graph, all right? So now it tells us the full employment level is still 510, just the same as it was before. But we've got excessive spending and we're up at that AE2. So we're producing at the 530 level because people are spending all this money. Well, the government wants to do something now to decrease spending, to move us down from AE2 to AE0. It's the same calculations because they have that same change in GDP. It's just this time we need to decrease GDP by 20 billion. Our multiplier is still four, so negative 20 billion divided by four means spending needs to go down by five billion. So this is just the application. We have even more recent application of this that, that you have great knowledge of, I'm sure. But in 2007, we began to sink into that recession. Aggregate expenditures were going down, down, down. Consumption was going down. Investment spending's going down. We get this aggregate, I mean, this uh, recessionary expenditure gap. So Keynesian says government needs to do something about it. So government started sending tax rebate checks out. Money to people's houses, stimulus package, give them more money to spend. So consumption will come up and correct that Re uh, recessionary gap. You may have more information about that in 2020 when we uh, dealt with the COVID and so 
we began to close businesses down, slide into that recessionary gap, and government started sending stimulus pa package again, started sending people checks again. So Say's Law and Adam Smith says, leave the economy alone. That's classical economics. Leave it alone. The economy will automatically adjust. Laissez-faire. Leave it alone. Adam Smith believed this, wrote this in The Wealth of Nations, 1776, Say's Law, where you have the businesses and the households on each side of that graphic, and we see it's a closed system, and if you have a recession, it will self-correct, but that doesn't happen as quickly as people will, would want it to happen, and so John Maynard Keynes says, if cyclical employment, and not just if, but when cyclical unemployment happens, because anytime you've got a recession, you're going to have cyclical unemployment, it might not correct itself or it might not correct itself as quickly. And so government can, and Keynesian believes should, actively manage that macroeconomic instability, meaning increase spending in some way. They could increase government spending, they could decrease taxes, they can send out those stimulus checks. We're also going to be able to make some adjustments with monetary policy. We'll look at that starting in chapter 14.